My name is Leroy Moore. I work with the Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center. I also am on the board of the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum, which is in the process of being created. And as you drove in here, perhaps you notice back over that way, right where you turn to come in this way from the, the main entrance on the west gate of Rocky Flats, you pass the sign that said on a piece of land over there that that is where uh, we intend to one day to build the, Rocky, the building of the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum. Uh, the museum has the mission of telling the whole story, remembering the whole story of uh, Rocky Flats. And part of that, of course, is what happened in the buildings that used to be visible over there but have recently all been taken down as part of the uh, Kaiser Hill Department of Energy project to clean up the Rocky Flats, the site of the former Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant. But it was at Rocky Flats and those buildings over there that the uh, plutonium pit or the explosive plutonium core of all nuclear weapons in the U.S. arsenal were manufactured. Uh, one of the pieces of the story that the museum intends to tell is, of course, what happened there on that site uh, with the people that were doing that work. Another piece of the story that the museum intends to remember and that we're especially acknowledging today is the activity of people who resisted uh, the activity that was going on inside the factory. And uh, one of the uh, famous moments in the resistance of Rocky Flats was the occupation of railroad tracks leading into the factory. Just a little, just a few feet beyond where we are, there's a railroad spur that cuts across, and that and that spur used to uh, used to have an additional spur that led directly into the buildings of the factory itself. And in 1978, beginning in April 1978, and continuing for just about a year, there was a sustained civil disobedience blockade of the uh, railroad tracks uh, leading into the Rocky Flats plant. And uh, that's a memorable event to me because I had moved to Colorado in 1974 uh, to teach at the University of Denver. And I did not even know Rocky Flats existed. I had been paying attention to uh, nuclear weapons and to uh, Gandhian methods of uh, nonviolent resistance. Uh, but it was not until beginning in April 78, some people sat on the tracks at Rocky Flats, and when they were removed from the tracks and arrested, uh, others came and took their place. And that pattern of repeated uh, replacement and continued civil disobedience went on for about a year, sometimes referred to as the year of disobedience. And that's how I learned about Rocky Flats, and, and uh, I walked out of the academic world and into the activist world. I began to volunteer for the American Friends Service Committee, which we'll, you'll hear more about later uh, at that time. And uh, I had no idea that I was starting a whole new career, but, uh, <laughs> but I did. I, that Rocky Flats has become a second career for me. Uh, I've been working on the issue pretty steadily since that time. Um, in that period, 1978-79, turn around and look over there. See that skeleton of a teepee there behind you? You all saw it probably as you came in with the flags waving high. Um, that is that is actually the skeleton of the teepee that sat on the tracks at Rocky Flats for about nine months during that 12-month period that I referred to. And that, that uh, teepee uh, was put on the tracks. Uh, it, became the, uh, it became the kind of most visible symbol of that long-time civil disobedience resistance in that year. Uh, people driving uh, along the highway here uh, could see 
that the resistance on the tracks was still going on because that teepee was there and they could see it from the road. It was, at, it was not so far from here and then it was a good bit further south beyond Highway 72 for a good bit of that time. Uh, unfortunately today, I have to explain this to you, it's a little bit windy at Rocky Flats today, and therefore uh, the person to whom the, uh, who is uh, donating this, uh, presenting this teepee as an artifact to the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum. And the museum has many artifacts. We have a lot of artifacts from the uh, buildings that were part of the factory, and they're stored in some storage lockers behind this building. We are today receiving artifacts from people that were involved in the uh, resistance activities, and in particular, the TP from uh, Patrick Malone. And Patrick Malone, the uh, person who, thank you, Patrick Malone, the person who is presenting the TP today, came here from Atlanta, Georgia, and he's going to talk about his experience back in 1978-79. Patrick is a native of Denver, uh, who now lives in Atlanta, Georgia, as I said. So welcome, Patrick Malone. Thank you. Tom, itakiase. All my relations. Thank you for the win. We couldn't do it without you. Um, long ago and far away, well, just a little ways down there, I was born in Atlanta, or born in Inglewood with my six brothers and sisters. And let me tell you something, when I was about 18 years old, we went to Washington Park to have an, a birthday celebration for my grandmother, who was turning about 95. We had 300 people there, and 200 of them lived in Denver. And their children are still here. That's how I got here. If you look far enough out there, about 60 miles, when I got out of high school, at Cherry Creek High School in 1968, I lived on a ranch at the very edge of this Platte, the Platte Valley here. So I graduated from here. Then I went on to Colorado State University where I took Protest 101. Protest 101 was sit in. Hey, all you gotta do is sit in. Joan Baez came in, we took over the student center. I thought, hey, this is easy. I should be able to do this. Well then, I went to the University of Colorado in Denver in the late 60s. Now, hey, they had protest 200, man, let me tell you. We learned how to do a lot of protesting there. Well, later on, well, actually what happened is that was the first place I ever ran for president. I ran for student body president in 1974. I was the College of Engineering state senator, or senator. So yes, I've had much legislative experience. Now, I, I know what radiation is like. Is there anybody else here that knows what radiation is like? I was a non-destructive testing radiographer. What that means is I would, I was like a super dental hygienist. I would take x-rays of metal with radioactive isotopes that came out at a hundred curies. Oh, ready? Oh. A hundred curies is pretty hot, let me tell you. We could go through two inches of metal in 30 minutes and get... Speak more into the mic, people can't hear oh, okay. Hold it up there and speak right now. Okay. People in the back can't hear you. People can't hear me? Oh, that'll be a first. Um, I, I didn't like that experience. Let me tell you something. I didn't like the experience of using radioisotopes because it was a very strange experience. Let me tell you something. When I first came here in 1977, we had done a, a run out from Boulder. I think it was like the fall of 77. And I had a real interesting experience. I had hitchhiked from Colorado Springs and I got a ride with a uranium miner. So I showed up at the west gate 
with three ounces of uranium ore. Boy, I'm glad they didn't have a Geiger counter that day. So when I came out here in 1978, I was working with Rocky Flats Action Group. I was a member of that organization in those days. I came to the Westgate here and was handing out uh, leaflets. We were selling buttons, bumper stickers, and t-shirts with environmental action reprint service, which later became resource service, a group called EARS. Um, I did solar conferences and anti-nuke conferences with them for a couple of years, actually, up to that. My friend Ben, somebody called him up and said, hey, you know, they did this occupation and now it's over. We're going to do it again. You want to go? You want to go? You want to go? I said, hey, all right, let's do it. So when I came out on the second occupation was when they had the super snowstorm. Uh, does that sound familiar? Like a couple of days ago? Boy, I thought that was funny. Um, so I started in the beginning of May there was something about these railroad tracks. When I hit the railroad tracks, I thought, you know, this is a crazy place to live. That's just crazy. I mean, how many people do that? I don't know anybody. Anybody, anybody have friends ever live on railroad tracks? Ah, I thought, hey, this is cool. So when we started doing it, I thought, you know, this is something very different. Let's just stick with this for a while. So I decided to take a couple of years off, turned out to be five years, and I decided to become a professional protester because, well, I couldn't get the government to give me any money and I couldn't get the Russians to give me any money for being a protester. So I decided to sell buttons, bumper stickers, and t-shirts with ears, which I did for five years, and I made a lot of money doing that. I made at least $2,000 a year. <laughs> Hey, you, that's good living, man, let me tell you. We did this, we did that. It was about June of 78. I got arrested again. We had moved into the teepee somehow. I thought, wow, this is a perfect non-Euclidean solution to a geometric problem. Wow, parallel lines intersecting in space. Wow, this is cool. And all I had to do was sit down. A couple times get arrested. It was a little bit cold, a little bit windy. I went on tour in 1978. I went to the East Coast. I met a monk, a bald-headed dude, wears a saffron robe. Anybody remember him? That's Sawada. I brought Sawada here. He was a good guy. I love Sawada. We had some really cold times. I invited some people from Seabrook who rode bicycles from Boston, Massachusetts to Denver, Colorado. They were called the Solar Rollers. I had a good luck. I was able to get enough people to come out here and hang out month in, month out. Next thing, what's that? Oh. The next thing I knew, it was December. I've been arrested a few times. We were in court. We were driving back and forth. I thought, this is goofy. I'm getting up at the tracks. I'm committing a crime. I'm going to the courtroom, and we're talking about it right then and right there. It was like being in three dimensions at once. And I will tell you very mildly, it changed my life the first time I got arrested. As a matter of fact, I recommend that to anybody. And if you'd like, talk to me later. I think I can find some place for you to get arrested. Because this, when you get arrested, you are changing yourself. And that's what we did to people here. We changed them. We made a change in their life that we gave them an experience that changed them for the rest of their life. A lot of people said I was never normal after that. And they're right. I haven't been normal since then. I don't think of things in the same way. Um, I got arrested here 10 times. It was wild, let me tell you. I did about six months in jail. 
I did six weeks. The hardest six weeks I did was in protective custody after one of the inmates tried to kill me. Of course, I don't know. The system got their revenge. He and his brother later took the electric chair for other crimes they had committed. I got arrested about 10 times other places. A couple times in Boulder. The last four times I was arrested was two here in 1983. I did Vandenberg in 83, and I did uh, Livermore Lab in 83. I did that with Dan Ellsberg and his wife, Patricia. I was changed. Lots of people are changed when they do things like this. Now, you know, Denver's become a museum mecca. I hear you just built a really groovy museum here. I hear they're going to build another one right here. And they're going to have something that never happened in human history. That TP represents something, but that TP represents the only time in human history when anybody put a TP on the railroad tracks anywhere in any time. That's it. I mean, how much more special can you get? <laughs> only time in human history, mm, we don't think it's going to happen again. Hey, that sounds like a museum for me. It sounds like a museum item for me. How about you? You guys want a museum item? All right. Well, there, um, I come from Atlanta. I live in Atlanta now. They've got a bunch of museums there. The Coke um, company has just recently donated that much land, except that much land is worth $2 million in Atlanta. They're building another civil rights museum. Well, what we're building here is a museum that represents both sides of the coin. The workers inside and the movement. Because Rocky Flats was the trigger for the weapons industry. Rocky Flats was the trigger for the protest movement in 1978. We helped this thing get going. The tracks occupation gathered people, stimulated people so much that they went, wow, that's cool. Let's go do this, let's go do that. And one of the things that Dan Ellsberg, when we talk, he talks about the 100 doors concept. He says, you get 100 people knocking on 100 doors, talking 100 different things, that's what movement is all about. You don't need 100 people doing the same thing all the time. That's just a bunch of people doing the same thing. Everybody here has their own personal motivations for why they were here or why they're here today, why they do whatever they do. And I want you to keep that sanctity. It's your right to have a heart. Now, I am very much for this. And as a matter of fact, the Rocky Flats Truth Force had a meeting at the Old Mother's Cafe this morning. <laughs> Now, they call it dots, but we call it mothers. And those Rocky Flats trackies decided, well, where's your hand? Raise your hand, tracky. Oh, there he was. We had a meeting this morning, and we pledge $1,000 to this. And not only that, I pledge that in the next year, I will try to help raise a million and a half dollars for this. Our half. The peace movement is going to contribute half of this. I will work until this thing is built if I got to come out here and build it myself. To tell you the truth, we could do pretty well just a bunch of teepees and put out a little. I like, God, I'd like to see a glove box in the teepee. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> Can we get one put out there and there? That would be pretty cool. Well, everybody kept saying, oh, you're not stopping the train, you're not stopping the train. Well, I didn't think we were going to stop the train there. I didn't think we were going to close that. But I tell you what, I enjoyed doing what I was doing. It made me feel good. And you know where it made me feel good? Right here. Because what I found out was the heart is mightier than the sword. Yes, the heart is mightier than the sword. We were out here not with nuclear weapons or tank grenade launchers or nothing. As a matter of fact, we didn't even like chains in those days. We were out here because we felt 
it was important to take our hearts and put it right out there and say, no, we don't think nuclear weapons are a viable form of military strategy. We don't think nuclear weapons are a viable form of using taxpayer money. I talked to somebody today, we got, we had solar collectors on the TV at one time. Ha <laughs> ha, you believe that? In 1978, we had solar collectors on the TV, and they just ripped them off the White House. I want to encourage people to go to your local museum, because the next thing you know, this will be your local museum. This will be where you can come and you can, you can do something like I did today. I'm out here with workers from Rocky Flats helping put up a teepee. And I think that we can work together and show our children, oh, by the way, I have five children. My youngest kid is 10 years old. My oldest one's 36. I don't know, I just can't say no. I want my children, I want my children to live in a place that they're not scared to death. We were scared to death of the nuclear war. I don't want that to happen again. I don't want to be scared to death of terrorism. I think this war stuff needs to have a little turnaround. Matter of fact, I heard there was a peace movement going to happen. Now, I'm going to unofficially say something that no one's going to hear, but I heard that later on today that there were going to be people who kind of went down and went to the tracks. And we may start off by just doing something as simple as sitting down. Now, if you want to do something really complicated, you can lay down. <laughs> you can lay down, put your head on one rail, put your feet on the other, and I will tell you something, that is an experience that will change you for the rest of your life. And there, there may even be a teepee there. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you all for coming today. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Kim Grant, and I'm the president of the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum, and I'm really pleased that you came out today to, sh to share in this, this special event. On Wednesday night, when uh, Patrick came to town and it snowed like it did, I was kind of worried about today. <laughs> but I had to remind myself of that old Colorado maxim that if you don't like the weather, just wait a day and it'll change. And, it certainly did. And besides, I told myself, many of today's participants didn't let a little snow slow them down 28 years ago now, did they? So, Before I turn to um, today's advance, I'd like to back up just a little and speak to you about the museum and its purpose. The Rocky Flats Cold War Museum is an outgrowth of a project that was initiated by the city of Arvada in 1999, for whom I work. At that time, it became apparent that both the physical plan of Rocky Flats itself, as well as the stories of the people who worked there and protested it, were in danger of being lost. Sadly, many of those folks have already left the area or passed on. So it's partly to their memory, then, that our efforts are dedicated. The museum effort formally incorporated in June 2001 as an independent 501c3 nonprofit corporation we felt that maintaining our independence was crucial to telling the often controversial story in a fair and balanced way. At times, that independence and commitment to the full story has rubbed some people the wrong way. But from a professional, historical, and museum perspective, it's the right thing to do. Of course, to do so, we need, and still need, a diverse board reflective of the many people, points of view, and experiences associated with Rocky Flats. Toward that end, we've recruited people who administered and worked at the plant, who protested the plant, who wrote about it from a journalistic and academic point of view, and who lived in the communities that surrounded the former plant site. We've also, for the most part, enjoyed the cooperation of the U.S. Department of Energy and Kaiser Hill Corporation, who oversaw the dismantling and decommission of the plant. And that process unfolded a lot quicker than, than we all thought it would. What that created was an imperative 
to act quickly to preserve artifacts and stories before they disappeared forever. Let me share with you a little of what we've accomplished in those areas. We have collected four large cargo containers, roughly the size of railroad boxcars, full of artifacts from the former plant site. We've collected thousands of photographs, paper documents, and related ephemera documenting the history of the site, including prehistory and cleanup. We've completed 90 professionally filmed, transcribed, and archived oral histories of former plant workers, community activists, and government officials. And that project was funded in part by a grant from the State Historical Fund of the Colorado Historical Society, for which we are really grateful. I'd also like to acknowledge that the project was done in conjunction with the Maria Rogers Oral History Program at the Carnegie Branch for Local History of the Boulder Public Library. And we want to thank them for everything they've done to help make those oral histories possible. We've also completed a feasibility and scoping study conducted by nationally recognized museum consultants that helped us shape um, the possibilities for a museum. We also conducted, again with the help of the State Historical Fund, an architectural assessment of the historic Lindsay Ranch property, which is a couple miles that way on the former plant site, um, that led DOE and the Fish and Wildlife Service to do some immediate stabilization work that would allow us in the future to use that ranch as part of the interpretive efforts on the plant site. And recently, and per perhaps most importantly, we received a conditional donation of 1.4 acres of land, right over here, from board member and longtime rancher, developer, and property owner, Charlie McKay. This donation is conditional on us being substantially ready to develop the site by January 2008. And we've also been involved in the formation of a national nuclear and Cold War themed museum and visitor network among former and present DOE plant sites. It's called the MSVC Net, and the purpose of it is to advise DOE on the preservation of its own legacy and cultural heritage. All of these accomplishments are fairly impressive, and we're proud of the dedicated people, mostly volunteers, who have made it possible. I'd like to take just a moment to recognize board members that are in attendance. If you're a board member, raise your hand, please. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. I'd li also like to turn very briefly to the mission and vision of the proposed museum, and then we'll get on with the body of the program. The mission, as Leroy alluded to, is to document the historical, environmental, and scientific legacy of Rocky Flats and to educate the public about Rocky Flats, the Cold War, and their legacies through preservation of key artifacts and development of interpretive and educational programs. The vision of the museum is to develop our 1.4 acre site over there into a 15,000 square foot scientific and technology oriented museum with interactive hands-on displays and engaging educational programs and symposia. We hope to introduce thousands of school children Cold War scholars and the general public to the history of the site, including its prehistory, geology, and wildlife resources, and of course the role the plant played in the larger Cold War and the nuclear age, which we all know didn't stop with the end of the Cold War. And we hope to cooperate with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Department of Energy, um, and including the Rocky Flats Stewardship Council on which we were represented in the development of this vision. To get there, however, we need a lot of help and support from folks like you and a lot of other people. To begin with, we need more artifacts, and that's part of what today's events are about. If you have them or know how to get a hold of them, please let us know. We have people who will help you fill out a donor form for your artifacts under the tents so that we can properly document them and thank you for it. And we've started to acquire some things already. If you don't have them with you, please let us know how we can get a hold of you so that we can contact them and uh, take possession of your items. And in addition, we obviously need your financial support. And 
Patrick, thank you for your generous pledge and commitment to help raise funds, because without that, it isn't going to happen. Inside your booklet, mine just blew away a minute ago, on the other side of the program is a donor uh, pledge card for use in making a financial contribution to the museum. Please consider do so, doing so. And again, we have people here under the tents later who will take your check and your pledge card um, when you're ready to make that commitment. But please do so. Time is of the essence. If we're to meet the challenge of our conditional donation and leverage some possible federal support, we need to raise three to four million dollars over the next 15 months or so. This is a tall order, but one that's doable. And while you're at it, please contact your congressional representative and let him know of your support and interest in this project. And again, thank you so much for coming today. And now I'd like to invite Leroy Moore back up here to introduce some very special guests. Thank you. Okay, are you able to hear still? I hope. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to see some people out there that I haven't seen in such a long, long time. Uh, and I'm glad to see people that I saw yesterday. Uh, so all of you are really welcome here today. Um, I, I had a conversation just a few days ago with Ann Guilfoyle. Is Ann, is Ann here? I'm not sure she is. Are you here, Ann? I don't, I don't see you anyway, but uh, holding up your hand. But uh, she was telling me that, uh, that, that in 1969, she and others uh, had a demonstration here at the West Gate of Rocky Flats. That's one of the earliest that I've heard of. I, I, I think I heard of one others that, that maybe consisted of three people uh, in 1968. Uh, but uh, that, that it, it's kind of amazing because not many people knew what was going on at Rocky Flats that it was a nuclear bomb factory, part of the whole complex of such factories around the country that produced nuclear weapons in the U.S. arsenal. Uh, not many people knew about it, and it was found out around that time by many. Uh, one, of the, one of the first people that I met when I uh, just got involved with the, with the Rocky Flats work was uh, a young woman that was working with the American Friends Service Committee. And that organization, it's a nationwide organization, national organization with an office in Denver. That organization uh, played such a key role for such a very long time from the early 60s until after uh, production halted at Rocky Flat, played such a key role in uh, focusing on uh, nuclear disarmament issues and environmental and health issues uh, for, uh, having to do with Rocky Flats. I'm going to introduce you to Judy Danielson, the person that will talk to you about the beginning of that work with the American Friends Service Committee. Judy, where's Judy? I know she's here somewhere. Ah, here she is. Judy is the purple lady today. So hang on to that and keep it close. I just donated my precious t-shirts. <laughs> In 1972, Pam Solo and I were hired to be American Friends Service Committee staff in Denver. We were looking for ways to connect locally to American Friends Service Committee's national campaign to stop production of the B-1 bomber. Dr. John Cobb, a professor at the CU Medical School who was on our committee, suggested the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant because Rockwell, maker of the B-1 bomber, was bidding to manage Rocky Flats. Pam and I had both been part of an earlier action where we went out to neighborhoods near Rocky Flats and knocked on doors and asked if we could spoon some soil and leaves from their backyards into our baggies. We said we would present suitcases of these soil samples. I, I lost it. Hello? Is it, is it still there? There goes my hat. <laughs> Thank you. Hello? No, it was, there it is. No, it was on, Mom. It was on. 
Now it's on, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We said we'd present suitcases of the soil samples. Oh, it went out again. It's out, huh? It's under your, under your microphone. Oh, maybe I'm pushing a switch. No, there's no switch on the microphone. Hello? 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 We said we'd present suitcases of these soil samples uh, to candidates running for Congress that year and ask them to have the soil tested. There's nothing there. I think you're just going to have to I'll have to shout. when the war ended and that conversion was possible if there was a will. We also met with Governor-elect Dick Lamons and Representative-elect Tim Worth, asking them to make Rocky Flats a priority when they took office. They put together a Rocky Flats task force with Jock Cobb as a member to consider the impact to Colorado and make recommendations. In 1974, we joined with Maury Wolfson of Environmental Action of Colorado and formed the Rocky Flats Action Group, with a number of people here today participating. One committee uh, printed up our, our Bible booklet, which was called Local Hazard, Global Threat. We uh, planned actions and set up a speaker's bureau. Interestingly, Environmental Action wanted to focus on disarmament, while we at the American Friends Service Committee, a peace organization, thought that environment was going to be the vehicle. I'm going to just put this on you. No. Oh. Pam was a visionary and student of Mohandas Gandhi, who had fought a nonviolent campaign and liberated India from British rule. She wanted to create a Gandhian nonviolent campaign to liberate us from the threat of nuclear arms and to begin a discussion in the whole community. This required defining the problem of the plant in a way that many different groups could own it, begin to see the connections, and look for solutions. The strategy was to organize in as many communities as we could. We had interesting meetings in the Cobbs home with Robert Williams, Rocky Flats manager, and Felix Owens in PR for Rockwell, urging them to reconsider their role in nuclear weapons production. Felix said we were in more danger living in a brick home than working at Rocky Flats. I'm afraid both of these men have since died while we are still here. We began talks with Tony Mizaki of the Colorado Health Department, who later became head of the Oil Chemical Ato Atomic Workers Union, and Carl Johnson of the Jefferson County Health Department, who was very key in, in a lot of the work. We testified at hearings, went to meetings, wrote letters to the editor, held our own hearings at the Colorado Medical Center. We met people like Kay Gable, whose husband Don had worked right under the ducks at Rocky Flats and suddenly died of brain cancer. His brain, by the way, was given to Los Alamos Nuclear Labs for tests. And later, when Kay wanted independent tests to be done, it was found to be lost. Lloyd Mixon, a farmer near Rocky Flats, came to one hearing with his baby pig Scooter who had deformed, useless hind legs and told of his hens laying eggs that never hatched. On further inspection, opening the eggs, he found the chicks with curled, deformed beaks. So the chicks couldn't peck their way out of the shell and died. We were building a broad movement concerned about Rocky Flats. 
It included people opposed to nuclear weapons for moral reasons, environmentalists, workers concerned about their own health and also job security, neighbors of the plant concerned about health threats and property values, and social justice advocates who saw how the arms race stole resources from us all. In 1978, we got approval from National AFSC to organize a nonviolent civil disobedience at Rocky Flats. We knew the plant was heavily armed and had battle-ready tanks underground. We didn't know what risks there might be for particip participants, but we began to organize. We took our slideshow to a National Mobilization for Survival conference of groups working to curb nuclear power showed them the links with nuclear weapons and urged people to come from around the country. Locally, dozens of people participated in the, in the outreach to churches, schools, civic groups, and others. We invited a high-level Quaker delegation to come to visit uh, power groups and invited Daniel Ellsberg to come early and meet with the Rocky Flats Monitoring Committee members, with the governor and city council and the Rocky Flats management. We organized a downtown rally before the one at Rocky Flats, where Stokely Carmichael of Black Panther fame, local Chicano leader and legislator Rich Castro, and others came to talk about priorities, weapons spending as opposed to spending on human needs. As a re result of national organizing that Pam and Mike Jindrizic of the Fellowship of Reconciliation have been doing, Bill Ramsey drove a flatbed truck loaded with 55-gallon drums and labeled plutonium starting at Savannah River, South Carolina and traveling through communities that had production facilities for nuclear bombs as he came to our rally and talking about the issues. The National Resources Defense Council came and held national hearings on the dangers of nuclear weapons production the day after the rally. We did hold the wonderful rally here and the well-planned night of civil disobedience on the tracks. When Patrick set up his teepee and Alan Ellsberg and other activists decided to extend the action we all had planned into a prolonged presence blocking the tracks, we worried that it, it and the committed demonstrators on the train tracks would be the focus instead of the issues and that the campaign could be dismissed. I know this was a powerful, life-changing event for many people, and many of you have become leaders in this campaign and other campaigns for human rights and peace. In some ways, it made more difficult the task of building on fragile relationships we had developed with uh, unions and other groups. But uh, it was an important event for many. The AFSC continued organizing locally and nationally, and the campaign to end nuclear weapons production in this country seems more urgent than ever today, as more countries are vying to develop nuclear arsenals to protect themselves from U.S. threats of intervention in their affairs. The U.S. still has intercontinental weapons in silos here in Colorado, poised to hit and destroy any city and potentially set off chain reactions. We have our work to do to eliminate the Axis of evil weapons. Thanks. Okay. Where is this going again? This little microphone here is not going to be helping you much. Uh, this whole event today is being videotaped uh, by Hunter Nordhaus here for the museum. And this microphone is for the videotape, not for you, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Good. Uh, because uh, I want you to hear me. And I'm, uh, I'm one of the, uh, I've got a little artifact here. Uh, it's a book called Songs to Convert Rocky Flats, this little blue book that's in my left hand. And this book was actually put together by Judy Danielson that you just heard from and her husband, Eric Wright, who is coming over here right now to lead us in songs. One of the things that happened <coughs> is that the movement had music couldn't have gotten along without music. 
So Eric. These visit just four songs out of that little book. Sort of the greatest hits of the songs to convert Rocket Flag. I don't know if any of you uh, people driving at least up from Denver came around this out. East corner there noticed our herd of cows. They've been an important part of our movement for a long time. So we're gonna have one of my favorites. It's called the cow song. It's on your feet there on the front page if you've got it folded correctly. Alright, we'll go with up from there. Of East Colorado, where grass grows and it's just and tall. And I'm all agree with each other. We don't like radiation at all. Cows are our friends and our neighbors, and they're part of the working class too. And because of the fruits of their labors, we've yogurt and butter for you. No news, no news, no radioactive junk in my milk if you please. No news, no news, we'd rather make ice cream and cheese. Cows are like most other women. As mothers, they work without pay. But sisters united in struggle. They're working to see better days. It's no news, no news. No reactive junk in my milk, if you please. aren't close enough to sing along so it might sort of bring them into the action if a few of you kind of took on the cow line in the chorus which goes just like that crank the cows don't like strontium night yep they say that it curdles their cream those cows have a socialist dream Stop making those triggers Before we're all blown up for dead Use all the skills of your workers You could make us new milk trucks instead Rocky Flats demonstration. There'll be one more affinity group. You'll know that by arms and by others. That'll be our most militant troop. And as they drag them off to jail, they'll sing. No goose, no goose, no radioactive junk in my milk. If you please, no goose, no goose. We'd rather make ice cream and cheese. Like many others, this song was stolen from the anti-nuclear power movement up in uh, Oregon, I think it was. Terry Sorrell uh, made those words and we just altered them a little. The next one on the inside, uh, we stole the whole deal. Uh, Stephen Sutherland actually met the words to this very famous tune written by Melvina Reynolds and Pete Seeger, I think. Which one? Is it There's bomb? a bomb plant on the hillside. Okay. Sorry, the pages didn't get numbered here. Let me get the right page here. There's a bomb plant on the hillside. There's a bomb plant making out a box. Box filled with plutonium. Plutonium is insane. 
we're tactical and strategic ones. Come your choice of megatons, and they're all filled with plutonium, and they all kill just the same. And the government takes their taxes and gives them to the military, and the military gives to Rockwell, and Rockwell makes the bombs. There are tactical and strategic ones. Come in your choice of megatons, and they're all filled with plutonium, and they all kill just the same. And the bombs get put on missiles, stationed everywhere around the world, and there ain't human beings, human beings, it's insane. There are tactical and strategic ones. Come in your choice of megatons, and they all kill with plutonium, and they all kill just the same. No more bomb plants on the hillside. No more taxes to the military. No more profits go to Rockwell. No more radiation. Armament, then there'll be no more bomb plants, and we'll all be much more As Patrick was saying when he spoke a bit ago, uh, there are many sides, there were many sides to the uh, resistance uh, efforts dealing with the Rocky Flats plant. Um, you've seen some of them already and there'll be more this afternoon, but a crucial part was played by uh, local scientists and I'm going to invite uh, Professor Harvey Nichols who is a chemistry professor at the University of Colorado and on the Boulder campus and who did some important work having to do with Rocky Flats that led on to other things. Harvey, please come. Welcome Harvey Nichols.